Welcome everyone. This is the Union County Wildlife Chapters um, monthly meeting. We are recording this, so if you don't want to be on camera, make sure you go ahead and turn your cameras off. Um, and please make sure that you mute your microphones so that we're not all talking over each other. Um, this evening, we are joined by CC King with the Wildlife um, Resource Commission, and she will be speaking on aquatic considerations and freshwater habitat management in North Carolina. Um, I will let CC introduce herself a little bit more and her background, um, and so I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brianna. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Fantastic. Great to be with you all this evening. I am Cece King with the Wildlife Resources Commission and I am what's called a regional education specialist. We do train the trainer workshops throughout the year and there are three of us that serve North Carolina. Myself in the Piedmont, Tanya Poole in the mountains and Rebecca Skiba at the coast. So if you are a parent of students or you know an educator or you are an educator, you are our primary audience and we love to show up or virtually or in person to bring programs um, to folks in the state that are then serving our young people uh, pre-K through college. And you want more background? I can give you a little background. I did my environmental education training at Teton Science School. Um, uh, but some of my first fond memories of North Carolina when I got here, yes, I married in, I am a Yankee interloper, were uh, in near Union County in Waxhaw. Is that, is, is it was Waxhaw in Union? I'm pretty sure. Or maybe yes. right next yeah. <laughs> yes, right on. Uh, riding horses um, after teaching at Charlotte Latin School. So for those of you that are from the area around where Brianna is, who invited me to come in tonight, I am um, familiar with your landscape. So it's good to be with you. All right, so before Cece starts her presentation, um, again, if you don't wanna be on camera, make sure your cameras are off. Please keep your microphones muted. And if you have questions throughout the presentation, um, please put them in the chat box. Thank you, Brianna. Right. We'll, we'll go ahead and let you uh, share your screen. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. I'm honored to be here with you all. I'm looking forward to sharing some information about aquatic wildlife habitats and some examples of contemporary issues managed by our agency. The Wildlife Resources Commission is a regulatory agency responsible for the enforcement of North Carolina fishing, hunting, trapping, and boating laws. Our mission is to conserve North Carolina's wildlife resources and their habitats and provide programs and opportunities that allow hunters, anglers, boaters, and other outdoor enthusiasts to enjoy wildlife associated recreation. We achieve our mission through research, scientific management, wise use and public input. When we look at a river like the Little Tennessee, we might think about fishing or floating in clean water through a beautiful landscape. And to get to that result, there's a lot that needs to be in place. Many factors working together, making the river capable of hosting great biodiversity with rich, healthy streamside forest and lots of microhabitat. When agency staff look at a body of water, we seek to address management issues from a systems perspective. We consider the body as a whole and the habitat in the context. Aquatic diversity biologists provide assistance with watershed planning, stream restoration, and conservation partnerships. They offer technical guidance to minimize impacts to rare and important species and their habitats. The river is formed by the entire watershed. Precipitation drives the stream systems. It percolates into groundwater, it feeds the streams, the flow continues even when there's no rain, and likewise, the stream feeds the groundwater. So what we do on the land influences the volume and the quality of the water downslope. This is a small stream that feeds the local river. Upland seeps, springs, and intermittent streams make up the linear bulk of the watershed system. The vast majority of streams by length are headwater streams. River systems have a lot of similarities to our circulatory system. Like tiny capillaries, headwater streams influence the habitat and water quality of downstream waters. When we take care of the small things, the big things sometimes take care of themselves. 
Though headwater streams are very small and drain smaller watersheds, they comprise the vast majority of the stream network in North Carolina. We might value the local river more than the little surrounding streams, but these streams are the places where nutrient cycle, groundwater is recharged, and flood water is abated. They're also a source of organic matter, helping form the base of the aquatic food web. Healthy streams are messy. They're not neat and trim, straight and spotless. Instead, they've gone to seed. There's detritus and weeds, some muck and algae, with dead leaves on the bottom and plants overhanging the banks. Driving biodiversity is that stream habitat. The greater the diversity of the habitats, the greater the diversity of species. In this image, we have riparian vegetation and edge habitat, riffles, pools, vegetation of woody debris and leaves, complex substrate, different rock sizes, variety of depths, some good flow velocity, and all of that in a winding stream bed. If you were to just look at the water itself in the stream, you might begin to get some of the apparent characteristics of the water body, including the temperature, the clarity, the sediment load, when possible, the chemistry. You might measure nutrients, test for viruses and bacteria, or notice how quickly the sediment settles after a storm event. But you will not want to just look at the water. A good stream doctor, you will go beyond the water itself and look at either side to assess the entirety of that water body. The riparian or streamside habitat is the habitat or vegetation that's not in the stream, but outside and alongside the stream. It is very important in determining how healthy that stream is and what goes on in the stream. It provides the base of the food web and treats the nutrients and pollutants that come in, moderates temperatures, making it cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. It's a source of wood, leaves, organic matter. It stabilizes the banks, provides habitat for terrestrial creatures that are part of the system, and makes up the whole of the body. So these are the components of stream and riparian habitat, and it works at every scale. The variables that matter for health are similar across these aquatic systems. There's some variation based on underlying geology and geomorphology, and depending on your ecoregion, but the processes in the system share many similarities. And these are the factors that indicate if the system is functioning well. While the surface of a healthy stream can provide great solace and joy, under that surface of the water can be fantastically beautiful also. This image is special thanks to Freshwater Illustrated, and it's a picture of a river chub nest made from pebbles gathered one by one, and the chub and other species use the nest. This is just one example of the diversity that we see in our North Carolina streams. Driving this biodiversity is the aquatic food web. On the right side of this diagram, you can see the path of leaf fall and the role of the vegetation from the streamside forest driving the forming of the base of that web. The leaves and the sticks are colonized by bacteria and fungi, which break down organic matter. Insects, such as macroinvertebrates, feed on that coarse material, the bacteria, the fungi. And when they emerge from the water, they become food for spiders, bats, birds, reptiles, amphibians. Crayfish, salamanders, and fish feed on those insects, and they're eaten by larger fish who then in turn are fed on by mammals that are living or passing through the riparian habitat. And all together, this creates this teeming, fantastic cycle of life. In North Carolina, we are blessed with abundant diversity, partially due to our geologic history and in part because of our climate. Streams across the state, while they vary from rushing mountain streams to slow coastal rivers, taken together, provide home to a tremendous diversity of animals. By conserving and restoring stream habitats, we influence the food web, which determines the biodiversity. So when we work to keep our waterways healthy, these aquatic systems support thriving life. Sometimes we have other priorities and we alter the natural networks. When streams are channelized, they cease to function optimally. You can see here there's no edge habitat influencing the diversity and there's less leaf litter, less detritus, 
to help form the base of the food web. With increased flow, there's increased capacity for sediment load. Large scale clearing of a landscape greatly influences water quality. There are significant impacts from erosion and sedimentation on the stream food web. Deforestation also changes the amount of water that gets into the groundwater, altering the base flow into the stream. Without vegetation to capture precipitation, flow increases, influencing the volume and the quality of the water and its effects on the stream's shape, on the substrate, and on the banks. We see much flashier flows when we clear the land. Livestock in our creeks introduce sediment and nutrient loads, and the monoculture around them further challenges biodiversity. Streets with storm drains also influence the local streams. Just as headwater streams can be a source of pollution, streets act as ephemeral streams, transporting water during storm events. Again, whatever is done within the landscape that this road drains can also influence the nearby stream because what goes into that storm drain goes directly to the stream system. The absence of banks, substrate, and organic matter increase flood risk. Groundwater is not recharged. The drain becomes a source of pollution. Eventually, our eye begins to see the cumulative impacts of human influence on water flow and the threats to our native biodiversity. We recognize our patterns on the landscape that do not serve biodiversity of life that the state is capable of supporting and turn to tools like the green growth toolbox to help us plan the green before the gray and reduce our impacts. Some people join with other backyard naturalists to turn from mowing, blowing, and spraying towards sowing, growing, and decaying. Like a stream, a messy yard is also a healthy one. And to address the cumulative impacts of human use of the landscape, biologists turn to tools and partnerships as we collectively address the cost of resource extraction and unsustainable practices. The North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission uses surveys and monitoring, restoration, and regulation in an attempt to support the diversity of species in our state. An example of such efforts is our work with freshwater mussels. One of the factors influencing water quality is the presence of freshwater mussels. In our state, these mussels display fabulous diversity and an amazing array of often bizarre ecological adaptations along with a complex life history. They also face dire conservation plight. The commission makes great efforts to save these fascinating beings for the future of our fauna and for the well-being of our waterways. Mussels are capable of filtering a liter of water per hour. They inhabit the base of the aquatic food web and play a critical role in water quality. As these images show, in just one day, mussels filter sediment from the water, restoring clarity for insulation to reach the lower in the water and for the submerged vegetation and for visibility for aquatic wildlife. Removing sediment allows the macroinvertebrates to breathe and the fish and further supports the food web. As we mentioned, mussels face similar challenges to other aquatic species. They've been significantly affected by hydrologic and thermal alteration due to dams or impoundments and tailwaters, as well as habitat loss, invasive species, excess pollution from sediment and point source pollution. But in addition to all that, they have a complex life cycle, making survival particularly tricky for them. To assist with mussel populations, the Commission operates a conservation aquaculture program. Because of our geologic history, North Carolina is a global hotspot for some species. Salamanders and mussels are among them. Of the mussels, six species are considered extirpated. 27 have a knowledge gap priority species status and 30 are in management priority species status. The uniqueness of the life cycle of the mussel is because the mussel is an angler. <laughs> yep, mussels go fishing. They rely on fish as a host 
for their glochidia, which are parasitic, and they have to attract fish to them and then get the glochidia to attach to that fish as host, where it later releases as a juvenile and grows into an adult. To attract the fish, the mussels use many strategies. They can use a conglutinate lure that looks like a worm. They use an ovisac, which releases a bunch of the glochidia at once. And mantle lures, which really look like a little miniature fish. And so when the fish comes in to grab it, the mussel then fills its face with a bunch of glochidia. It's pretty intense if you look up the videos. There are a few different strategies as we propagate the mussels. One is to simply protect their existing habitat. And the next, of course, if that habitat has been dammed and they can't get there is to restore them to their historical habitat. And we do that by going around uh, and translocating the mussels back upstream above where we may have dammed or propagating them and then putting them back into that historical habitat range. At Marion is where we have the conservation center established in 2008, where we focus on freshwater mussels. There are only other, there are only 17 other facilities in the U.S. that propagate freshwater mussels, and the majority are research facilities. Of our freshwater mussels, 28% of them are federally listed. Two thirds, 61%, are state listed, and 90% are listed as special concern. This is what the inside of the hatchery looks like in Marion, where we are culturing those mussels under the guidance of Rachel Hoke. Rachel and her team employ a variety of techniques for tagging and tracking those mussels in mark and recapture studies. And in the end, even if you're not so interested in mussels, you can know that muscle restoration equals clean water and clean water is good for us. If Rachel were here, she would ask, have you checked your septic system lately? Have you watched when the water leans, leaves your property? Is there any erosion going on? Have you paid attention to emerging issues, specifically about pharmaceuticals? And have you opened the green growth toolbox to see how you can participate in more sustainable development and urbanization in our state. Rachel provided this slide as well. She said that mussels are referred to as the naiads, and the naiads were nymphs who gave life to fresh water. Mussels are only one type of the many species that we work with under the Aquatic Wild Diversity Program. We also work with chub, and crayfish and many other aquatic species, snails. Oops. As you can see from the slide, the biodiversity of mussels and salamanders in North Carolina is part of a larger occurrence of biodiversity in the southeastern United States. We are a hot spot here, especially on the western side of the Eastern Continental Divide for fish diversity. Working in the Inland Fisheries Division, one can wear many hats. We often focus on game fish and non-game fish because they have different funding sources. But as you can see here, we really do have a tremendous number of different species in our state. And that's really what we're focusing on tonight, celebrating that aquatic diversity. One of the management tools we have for monitoring our fish is electrofishing. You can see in the picture on the right, they've got a boat and it's an electrical charge that goes into the water, which temporarily stuns the fish. The bottom left, that's being done with backpacks. That way we take a sample of the population and measure and determine whether the population is thriving. 
Our catfish surveys are fairly straightforward with kick nets and snorkeling and some electric fishing, but for the most part we're mucking about out in the rivers looking for crayfish. Muscle surveys are also done through snorkeling, long days face down in the water looking for a tiny slit in a rock that differentiates it. In addition to surveys, we do reintroduction. The lake sturgeon is an example of a species that was extirpated, last observed in North Carolina in 1946 near Hot Springs, and a broodstock has been collected in Wisconsin, hatched at the Warm Springs uh, hatchery in Georgia, and then grown out in Edenton, North Carolina, and Table Rock fish hatcheries, and then stocked annually since 2015. We have already had some angler reported catches again since 2018. This is a species that um, was quote unquote discovered in 1992, but the Cherokee have a long history with the sicklefin red horse. It's considered federally endangered. Dams, pollution, and non native species once again have threatened it. Um, and it has a limited population distribution but through augmentation and propagation, we are able to reintroduce it. Here you can see the biologists have set up a net with a flare at the end, and as the red horse swims up river, it gets caught in those nets, and then they're collected and the eggs are manually fertilized. The hatchlings are then grown out and then reintroduced into the river and species are recollected, populations are retested to see how they are recovering. Not only do we support the wildlife themselves, but we also really work on habitat and specifically using aquatic vegetation to enhance habitat for native sport fish populations. There are several types of aquatic vegetation. First is emergent plants that grow in the shallowest water. One example of this is water willow. It doesn't tolerate being submerged, but it is uh, really a tough plant. It makes a dense colony, which makes it less susceptible to predation by herbivores. The next category of plants are the rooted floating leaf plants. You're very familiar with these probably, as was Claude Monet, <laughs> like uh, water lilies. Once again, we prefer the white water lily and spatter dock because they are resistant to herbivory and that is one of the greatest challenges while we're trying to reintroduce native plants to restore aquatic habitats. And finally, there are the submerged plants which need the water to not be full of sediment so that once again, that insulation can make it down under the surface of the water. They have some parts above the water, but for the most part, the bulk of the plant is down underwater and they provide, again, habitat for sport fish. Two that we are growing in the Sykes Depot um, aquatic plant nursery are wild celery and the American pondweed. They are subject to herbivory, but they also um, do quite well in our reservoirs, and that's where we're doing this restoration. And of course, while we say we're working for sport fish and we're using sport fish funding for that work, and that is true, this also has the side effect of enhancing habitat for other aquatic organisms and providing refuge for spawning and foraging and growth. As you can see here, the turtles, the ducks, and the other small species of fish are also benefiting from this habitat and the structure that is being planted in these reservoirs. A couple other benefits of aquatic plant restoration is that it reduces the wave energy from boats or just natural wave energy buffering the shoreline habitat. Of course, the plants capture nutrients, capture sediment, improve water quality. They absorb some pollutants and they reduce erosion along the shoreline. If Mark Folks were here, who runs the aquatic nursery at Sykes Depot, he would say maybe his favorite thing about them is that they're so aesthetically pleasing. 
and they are stretching along the shorelines and they have flowers that benefit humming I mean uh, bumblebees and honeybees they provide nectar for insects he calls that image on the far right his Monet this is the aquatic nursery plant nursery at Sykes Depot and you can see the greenhouse it's a hoop house that was heated and um, oh, I don't know how many plants were actually started here but 2300 actually went out into new habitat the monies for sport fish restoration come from anglers who buy a fishing license or buy fishing equipment and a portion of those monies goes through uh, federal coffers and then gets allocated to the states as you can imagine it's a tremendous amount of work volunteers are quite helpful and some of the plants need to be fenced in again because of that intense herbivory pressure native plants are introduced using the founder colony concept where they're established inside these enclosures where they exclude any of the herbivory pressure that would be taking out those efforts and give the plants a chance to expand and colonize and here you can see the intention and it does it is working where the initial fenced enclosure has just a few species and then they spread over time and go all along the shoreline on the right you can see at oak hollow there's a little cove which has been fenced out even from deer who can walk in and start eating and then here at Lake Gaston there are about 10 of these we've been doing this for quite a while with the Commission and we're just really getting quite active again as an agency and then finally our education division does aquatic work but only through sharing the joys and the wonders especially with macro invertebrates as a teaching aid because they're simple to get a hold of highly accessible there's no money involved and the students can practice citizen science and those little macro invertebrates have pretty established life cycles we can count on them being there they don't go very far and they're such an important part of the food web and such great indicators of water quality that they're super teachers for our students about the importance of clean water Students who come to class learn about mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies as indicators of the habitat quality, damsels, beetles, and dobsons as possibly slightly less uh, sensitive habitat. And then, of course, going down to um, some of the aquatic worms and leeches as uh, indicators of denuded water quality. And that helps them become greater participants through local stream watch groups or local watershed education organizations local nonprofits there are many many ways to reach out in your community and participate and become a volunteer become someone who is helping um, keep watch over your local watershed this is just a view of some of the tools we use to sample benthic macroinvertebrates and what it looks like once you let all the sediments settle on the bottom using a white bottom pan so you can really pick through the debris and the detritus and pull out those critters very gently to try to identify them and figure out how um, healthy your water is it is important to know that mayflies caddisflies and stoneflies while often used as indicators of high water quality do have a great diversity in their genus and some of the species are a lot more tolerant than others even within mayflies in the upper right corner you can see someone picking up leaf packs and if you go online you'll find leaf pack and that's a really cool tool for using to looking at macroinvertebrates as well so i hope you get together with some friends and neighbors community members your own kids and um, head out in your creek and enjoy the warming weather and get to know your local aquatic habitat i want to thank rachel hoke mark folks and andrea leslie for some of their slides as i put this together and then give you the names of your local district biologists brina jones who focuses on mussels in the piedmont casey grishabar who is your district six biologist and Catherine DeVilbus who is the Central Region Aquatic Wildlife Diversity Biologist. All of us have the same email. It goes our name 
dot our last name at ncwildlife.org, brina.jones, ncwildlife.org, etc. Thanks, everyone. And I think I saw, can you hear me? I think yes. I saw Todd Ewing in the room, and I'm hoping that he can correct my pronunciation of some of our biologists, whom I emailed for permission to give their names out. <laughs> Mostly yeah, it's Casey. Correct. Oh, it did. Casey's name? Grisha Close Moore? enough. <laughs> okay. That's great. Well, uh, as you may have noticed, I pre-recorded that because it is a ton of information to keep in one's head. So I apologize for not just saying it all at once, but I thought it would go a little more smoothly to um, to go ahead and follow that script pretty tightly. Uh, but it's really great to be here with you all. And I don't know where you're all from. I would love to know a sort of what is your eco region and your habitat type around you. Are you living in an urban or suburban setting? I don't know how you do these, Madison and Brianna. Do you, does everyone sort of unmute and share or? Yeah. Um, so it seems like somebody has their hand raised, um, so they may have a question. So um, Kristen, if you have a question and you want to come off of mute, um, you can go ahead and do that and just ask CC whatever question you have. Hi. Um, yeah, first off, uh, great. Uh, information. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and actually, I've been waiting forever for somebody like you. Um, <laughs> I built right. a wildlife pond in my yard. I'm okay. in Huntersville and I'm in kind of the heart of a development. Um, but there are a couple little um, like shrubbery patches that still kind of give animals a little bit of access. Um, so I so I built this wildlife pond, but I'm struggling a little bit with keeping it. Like right now, I've got a lot of filamentous algae because mm -hmm. um, the pickerel weed hasn't really grown in yet. Um, but I'm just kind of wondering. Um, I don't. I haven't put anything in there. I know I get lots of um, dragonflies, and um, I've seen I got plenty of frogs, and um, I've seen an occasional salamander and stuff like that. I'm just wondering if um, you mentioned snails. I I'm wondering if, if that would help me or if you could recommend anything that might help me um, keep it naturally cleaner and keep some of the algae under control. Sounds like you're doing a great job so far and and, um, and I wish I was the answer to all your prayers, but I am not a backyard pond expert, but I do have um, a website and I'm going to give you my email right here. Um, for backyard naturalists that we've been building with collaborating with several different agencies um, across the state from stormwater people and um, extension and so forth. Um, I'm also working with Rockingham Community College on a backyard naturalist series and so because of those efforts we are actively collecting resources and that's one of our topics. A lot of people are trying to do um, rain gardens and other such, such things in their yards. Mm -hmm. So if you would email me, I will send you that um, the website and I'll also just send you resources that are specifically related. And if you send those questions, I'll reach out to our biologists for sure. So oh, okay. at least at least that um, somebody will help find your your answers. <laughs> great, great. And because I was doing well for the first couple of years, but now I'm getting a lot of sediment buildup and <sighs> I I'm willing to go in and clean it out. But I know that there's so many things living in that sediment. I don't I don't want to like I've actually it's funny because I'm looking at your pictures and I have cleaned out some of it and I wind up sitting there with a pan feeling like I'm gold mining or something, shaking it around, finding the little larvae and putting them back in and then dumping the rest and um, but I was just wondering if there was something that um, I could balance it because it's only five by eight. It's very small. So I kind of, um, you know, wanted to see if maybe there was something else I could put in it that might help keep the algae under better control. Um, so, OK, so I would definitely email you. Thank you. I don't want to make up an answer. Yeah. Yes, Brianna. I have one suggestion um, which we have been using. Um, with Union, I actually work for Union County Soil and Water Conservation District as well. And um, what we have been suggesting for owners of larger ponds that are having algae issues um, is barley straw. Um, there's been some research that suggests that it helps um, 
get rid of algae in ponds at, more naturally than using a lot of chemicals. So that might be something that you might want to look into as well. Yeah, I'll check. Thank you. I'll, I'll check that out. I thought I have heard of that, and then I thought that there was some reason why I thought it wasn't a good idea. Um, I don't know if it uh, the pond, like maybe I thought the pot, the um, pickerel weed might not like it, or there was something about the frogs. I don't remember, but there was some reason why I never put it in. Um, I don't use any chemicals. Occasionally, I used to throw um, mosquito dunks in there, but now I don't even do that because it seems to, I don't have any mosquito problems, so it seems to be balanced reasonably well. Um, but I'll try the bar bar eh, barley straw then and see how that goes. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Did anyone else have any questions? If you have any questions, you can come off of mute or you can put them in the chat. Um, you can raise your hand if you want to. And I will say um, we also do stream um, surveys at the Union County Agricultural Center. Um, we haven't been doing as much because of COVID, but if you are interested in doing something like that with us, all you have to do is uh, shoot me an email and I can put my email in the chat for that as well. I did a stream survey yesterday with our Monroe Stormwater Division and we actually found a lot. Um, so this is the time to really start getting out. If you're interested in macroinvertebrates, um, we did find like 12 caddis flies yesterday, the case building ones, which was the first time I've ever found one and we oh. found tons of them. And it was super cool because you could see them in their little cases. Um, we found one that was pretty big. I mean, it was fairly large and the rest were almost microscopic, you know, but um, if you are interested in macroinvertebrates, it's starting to get that season. Um, and if you want to learn more, then you are more than welcome to come out to our facility. And where is the facility located? Again, I'm sorry. Um, it is the Union County Agricultural Facility. So um, we're in Monroe, not too far from, I think you said you were in Huntersville, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do you have like a website that I could hit to, for more information or anything like that? We do, um, I can put that in the chat box. Okay, awesome, thank you. Every time I try to get any kind of help about this, um, you know, like you go online, everything, oh, put this chemical in, put that chemical in, you know, and I don't use any chemicals anywhere. Um, you know, my whole yard is, it's a backyard habitat now and everything. So I'm trying to get it done right, but um, it's tough when your neighbors spray stuff and all that, but um, so I'm just trying to, uh, to do the right thing. And it also sounds a little bit, and I, again, I don't know enough about your pond or the, but um, just from a wildlife management perspective, it's hard to support everyone. You know, mm -hmm. there are going to be um, some different needs for different species, right? And so you're, I'm hearing you say, I, I want them all to live. I'm like, well, when we, when we uh, as a different example, um, mm -hmm. if you have early successional habitat fields, that's really great habitat for rabbits and hawks and red foxes, but it's not good habitat for the for black bears who want to live in the woods or uh, gray foxes or you know so so that same concept applies at the microcosm to your little pond right <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, absolutely. yeah so so the balance of life is going to be um it is going to be continually changing and evolving um yeah. as you watch that happen yeah i'm not telling you anything you don't know so no 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 it's it's actually just funny that you mentioned that because um i have a hawk i call him steven because he's hawking and he's really smart um <laughs> and he's figured out if he sits in the mulberry bush above the pond um that when the frogs come up he just nails them and i'm happy about that because that's the whole point of of having all these things but um you know i don't want him to you know take all of them either so i've actually put some lattice work over one side because the um the vegetation really hasn't grown in yet um so the frogs are waking up before they're you know before the uh habitat that they can hide in is so, um, you know, I put some lattice work over there to at least protect one half of it so that he can't get all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a red shouldered? Um, I think so, yes. That would yeah. Be the, yeah. He even bought his wife one time. It was kind of funny. <laughs> he got one. 
he went over to he he was sitting there with the um the frog and he went over to the fence post and then started calling another one came over and he actually dropped the frog and the other one took it and ate it um so i i guess i might have a breeding pair around somewhere but i see him at least every day so marvelous but uh it's his fun. wife that's classic <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was his mistress. I don't know. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> or maybe, you know, this is this is the 2000s. Maybe it was her and she was feeding her husband, you know. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Getting yeah. off that train right now. <laughs> That's funny. Well, um, is, is anyone here, thank you, is anyone here part of a uh, stream watch group or a local watershed um, resilience restoration group? No. No, I'm just in the Native Plant Society. Oh, like neat. That. That's neat. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. I actually had a question, CC. I know you mentioned that you guys are like growing different mussels for st stream restoration. Do you grow any like endangered ones too, or is that not really um, your field? I believe so. And Todd might be able to speak to that with more accuracy. Can you, Todd? Yeah, I can. Uh, we do grow several fairy listed mussels, actually. Uh, uh, Appalachian elk toe and, uh, sorry, I'm going blank. Tar River spiny mussel are two of the primary ones we grow out. Uh, we also grow uh, uh, the Carolina hill splitter, which a lot of you in Union County are probably all too familiar with. Uh, we don't grow as many of those because we don't have anywhere to put them right now. But uh, we also work with NC State to grow yellow lance, which is a federally threatened mussel, and dwarf wedge mussel as well. So, yeah, we do produce a fair number of fairly listed mussels. And Madison, we are using um, different techniques where I think they're um, harvesting eggs and then fertilizing eggs and propagating the mussels um, when we don't have a lot of species to work with. I mean, if there were, I think, only 40 of one particular species, if I remember, and um, Rachel collected them all and then they made thousands, you know, that we produced. Um, but Rachel Hook is very approachable and a lovely um, person and really um, forthcoming with all of her research and what she's doing. So if you ever want to find out more, feel free to, to contact her directly. I'm sure she'd be delighted. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks for um, sharing a bit more about that. That's that's super cool that you're able to grow some endangered mussels. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, one of the things that I have had the pleasure of doing is going out with Brina Jones and swimming and looking for mussels. And uh, for the last few summers, I've been able to do that. Brina is a horse person like me, but um, I think I was just a little more relaxed about horses than she was. I think she would have outridden me uh, <laughs> because she gets in that water and about 12 hours later, she comes back out again and it takes it is a long day and she will she'll look up at some point you know six hours in it's like did you need to eat something you know <laughs> so anyway and we go like i said face down looking for those muscles and it's just such a joy to be out there with the with the group and um and finding those little critters getting a search image um and uh, I remember asking her once, I got a call from someone near Charlotte and they said, we want to know where the endangered mussels are because we're a developer and we don't want to disturb them. And I thought, oh, well, let me call Brina and see what she says. And Brina said, now, do you think we tell them where the endangered mussels are? <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> I think we have another question. Trey, if you wanna um, take yourself off of mute and go ahead and ask. Hey. Thank you all for this presentation. It's been very interesting. Um, I'm really interested in freshwater um, ecosystems. I'm a student at NC State. Um, I live in an area that's kind of close to a wetland, and it'd be cool to, um, as much as I'd like to survey for mussels, I'm not totally sure how to identify them, but I am interested in sort of the um, fish identification within that area. And I've set out a trap. Of, I just bought a basic minnow trap from a store and I don't know if y'all have any advice for how to um, set that out. I put it out earlier today near sort of like a riffle area 
if you have like a preference for bait or should I wait for a certain temperature? And also, do y'all, if I want to get into muscle identification, how would I, what resources are available there? Um, I can find the books for muscle ID. It is a really um, specialized skill it's, and um, uh, not something that really comes easily. Uh, um, but I can certainly get you those, uh, Trey, if you email me. And I also would be happy to um, reach out to one of our fisheries biologists in the Raleigh area about best practices with regards to what you're talking with return in regard to to trapping and identifying fish. And are you talking about doing that in a wetland in Raleigh or where where are you? It's in it's in Greensboro. It's just in, oh, a, in Greensboro. Or, oh. I think it's. It's in an area that's not uh, as far as I know is not protected, so it's mm -hmm. as far as I know it is legal to um, put the trap yeah. out. Yeah, set it out and try to take a picture and just release it right back. Neat. Interesting. So you're in a lake or some sort of impoundment, not a creek in Greensboro or is it a creek? It's it's sort of it's sort of a creek. It's sort of like a a wetland sort of area that's all sort okay. of interconnected. It floods a lot. OK, I'm just yeah. interested in what could actually be in there. What could be in there? So you're at NCSU, but you live in Greensboro and you're and you're mucking about out there. That's neat. That's a wonderful way to get to know the natural world personally. That's right. Don't take their word for it. Um, you know, um, I don't know that a lot of people using iNaturalist give identifications from the um, aquatic world. What about you, Brianna? Do you know um, if iNat has a lot of aquatic? Um, because Trey could use that to find out what other people are observing. I'm not sure. I haven't used it that much for aquatics. Um, especially because if you're thinking about, I don't know, if you're using a cell phone to take a picture, it's really hard to do that if you have things that have to be in the water. Um, yeah. There was a new app, and I can't think of the name of it. We used it yesterday, but there's a new macroinvertebrate app, but I don't know that that would, mm. and it works kind of like Merlin. Mm -hmm. If you have that where you um, answer short questions. Is it um, Creek Critters? Is that the one you're using? Let me see if no. I can. I'll try okay. to look it up and I'll put it in the chat. Um, okay. Because it was one I had never heard of before, but that is one that you could use. But again, that's going to specialize in macros and yeah. not necessarily in all aquatics. Um, and it sounds like, Trey, you're more interested in maybe some mussels and things like that. So I wouldn't. Yeah. I don't know and what Shem, would be the best. <laughs> Shem yeah. has said muscles are likely not well represented on INAT, and that was kind of what my gut said, but I was just sort of hoping. Um, uh, yeah, they're they're pretty tough to identify. You can get some general groupings of them, and uh, and once again, uh, same answer, Trey. If you write to me, I will. Um, I can send you a few of the the more common types that might be found, but really they're not common. Um, I'm not even sure that they're found in that sort of wetland habitat you're talking about. I think there are a couple that do well in muddy, mucky areas, but only a couple. Um, they're more um, tolerant of that silt, but their job, you know, is to take the silt out of the water so, so that it, they don't really thrive in super silty habitats as a, as a group. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And I put it in the chat, but if anyone is interested, that app is Aquabugs. Thank you. That's a new one. Great. Nice. Well, I do want to encourage you to get out and um, muck about in your local creek and see what kind of critters you can find out there like Trey is doing. Um, it's it's absolutely a fantastic way to get familiar with the natural world, make that connection, build that relationship, um, and then you'll find yourself um, speaking for the for the waters and the critters in the water. Yeah. Well, if we don't have any further questions, um, I would like to say thank you to CC for doing this um, presentation for us tonight and. 
Um, I think we put both of our email addresses in the chat, so feel free to reach out to either one of us. Um, and I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.